Well, good morning. So, so here's the balance that you have to, because today we're going to talk about one of the verses Jesus says, don't judge. And yet there's times that you have to address the obvious, right? And so how do you do that? And Jesus describes how you do that the right way. Now, this is really cool. We're, we're getting to Luke uh, uh, into some good, where Jesus' first sermon, which is also called the Beatitudes, where as the young man reminded us, we take the golden rule out of here. That was awesome, by the way. I'm like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's great. Um, anyway, so see, you can, Jesus said a child will lead them. First grade, guys. First grade and showed up the pastor this morning, which shows you the level of intelligence that I have. But anyway, that's a smart kid, though, too, isn't he? So, um, make him an engineer. Uh, okay, so, sorry, did I say that out loud? Some of that was meant, or a surgeon. Um, he could pull the nail out. So, let me ask you a question today. So, today we're going to look at this idea, and we're going to look at Jesus' first sermon and talk about what we like to call the Beatitudes. And the word Beatitude is from the Latin for blessing, but literally in the Greek, what Jesus is saying to the people is, this is how to be happy. Now, we don't like that because it sounds like a fluffy sermon. Well, it's Jesus' first sermon, so it's not my fault. Um, But what he tells us about being happy is not as fluffy. So there's a story. uh, uh, These are my running shoes. You can tell they're hardly used. But... um, I wear them to ride a bike, actually, so I need bike shoes, I guess. But um, anyway, so um, there's a a story about a man who spends his whole life, he gets new shoes, and he spends his whole life running after happiness. And he pursues it first, uh, thinking that money will bring happiness. And he runs and runs and runs, and he, he gets the money, and he's not happy. And then he says, well, it'll be family. So he runs after family and he has kids and and thinks that's going to make me happy. And he's still not happy. So he runs after success and he runs after other things and habits and hobbies and thinks one of those is going to make me happy. And it's not the dolphins, just so you know, they're not going to make you happy. So the truth is, as you as you run after happiness, he's, he's running, and all of a sudden he looks over, and on a bench there's an old man. And he says, why, why aren't you running? Are, aren't you unhappy? And the man says, you can't run after happiness. He said, happiness is from understanding how blessed you are right where you're at, what you've been given, what you've been blessed with. He said, you're running after all these things and you're exhausted. And instead of recognizing that when you get still and quiet, you can recognize your blessings. And that's the truth for all of us. We are, listen, we are all broken. We all fall short. We all are spiritually hungry sometimes. We all are spiritually and emotionally lonely sometimes. Sometimes we're dealing with sickness, we're dealing with pain, we're dealing with frustration. And Jesus, in his very first sermon, I love this, he starts naming off all these awful conditions of life and the people sitting there had to be going, that's me. But it sounds like the opposite of what would make you happy. And so we're going to look at this today, and I'm going to give you four points. I usually do three points, but I just couldn't. And I would encourage you, if you can, at some point today, tomorrow, sometime, read Luke chapter 6. I I just, I was, you know, it's just hard. We're going through the whole book of Luke, and I'm trying to move along. And this is one book I could have spent, in this one chapter, I could have spent four weeks. And so instead, we're just going to get today, and I'm going to hit the highlights. But I would encourage you, read this chapter, let it speak to you. Let the life of Jesus from Dr. Luke, who wrote down this story, and by the way, Luke, not one of the disciples, but he got eyewitness accounts from the disciples, from uh, uh, other people, and, and went out of his way to share a very detailed story. And so here he shares the first sermon of Jesus. Number one, happiness, or what we call blessedness, comes from eternal focus. Listen to what he says. So he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and the coastal region around Tyre and 
and Sidon showed up. So a few verses later, he says, looking at his disciples, time to take your pill. Looking at his disciples, he said, that's my favorite line in the new Jumanji. He hears a beep and he goes, time to take my pill. It's great. Anyway, sorry. Uh, Looking at his disciples, Jesus says, blessed, which is the word makarios, which means happier or happiness, however you want to translate it. So you want to be happy for the rest of your life. It's not take a fat woman to be your uh, ugly woman. Have you heard that song? Kristen's dad used to sing that song. Did Did you remember him singing that? Look it up. I'm not singing it. Looking at his disciples, he said, if you want to be happy... He says, blessed or happy. Listen to what he says next. Are you who are poor? Which, if you were sitting in the crowd, you had to be like, what? Like the first sermon of Jesus is, if you're poor, you should be the happiest. Now, you got to realize that the Pharisees this whole time are teaching the opposite of that. They're teaching, if you are really following God, you're going to be blessed financially. If you're really following God, then you're going to uh, uh, have all the things that God calls you. By the way, if you pay attention to TV preachers, you'll hear some of those same things being taught today. That your success is from blessings from God. But he says, if you're poor, you're blessed Why, he said, for yours, listen, is the kingdom of God. See, he says, blessed are you if you're poor. Why? Because it's not about your circumstances now. You're going to inherit the kingdom of God. God is giving you something that's more important than how much money is in your pocket. And I know this for a fact. If you run after money, some of the most miserable people I know have lots of money and no peace and no family and no love. So be careful what you run after. Blessed are the poor. Why? Because yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you if you're hungry now. I love this because I'm always hungry. Always. Kristen, every once in a while, will say to me, are you hungry? And I told her, you don't have to ask that question. The answer is always, no matter what. She's like, well, you just ate. I'm like, yeah, I know. But we just ate just now. No, no, I know. I mean, I mean, like if I just eat, like if I go to a, one of those uh, uh, chef restaurants where they're throwing the food, the kibachi or whatever it's called, and they throw in the stuff on your plate and they're, they're filling it up and you eat the whole thing, I'm telling you, for about five minutes I feel full. And by the time I hit the car, I'm like, you want to get dessert? She's like, what is wrong with you? So she actually came home one day and said, you know, you know Eric, there's a genetic condition that causes people to be hungry all the time. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm hungry all the time. I don't, it could be me. It could be my gene. If you want to blame my genes, that's fine with me. But I'm hungry all the time. So I would have loved this part of the sermon. Because he would have said, blessed are the poor. I would have been like, I'm doing all right. And then he said, blessed are you if you're hungry. I'd be like, what? Now realize, in this time, a lot of people were hungry. All the, We don't understand hunger. I mean, do you realize how many times... Crowds gathered and Jesus fed them all. You ever really given that some thought? There were hungry people. They're sitting in a sermon and like, man, I hope he does the fish thing today. Right? So Jesus says, blessed are you who hunger now. Why? Listen, listen. You will be satisfied. Why? Because it's not about Physical food, I know that's hard to believe because you've tasted some really... I mean, have you ever just had a steak and like you think back on it and your mouth waters? You you had like the best meal and you actually can remember the meal and you remember the... And my mouth's watering just thinking, saying it to you. Jesus says you're going to be satisfied. Why? Because it's spiritual food that he brings. That's why when Jesus says to the disciples later on, I have food you don't know about, and they're looking around like where? The disciples, I feel really good. The disciples make me feel good because they're clueless all the time. And I'm like, I get it. I'm, that's me. And then he says, blessed are you who weep now. I don't know about you, but I don't like to weep. I don't like sad days. I don't like grieving. I don't like mourning. 
I don't go, man, I can't wait to grieve again. Jesus talks to me. And there were people there that had just lost loved ones, I'm sure. People there who were dealing with hard and difficult things, who were grieving. People who were dealing with difficulty with family and other situations, and they showed up with tear stains on their face in the middle of all the dirt they walked through every day. And Jesus says, blessed are you who weep now. And they had to be like, okay, what's that about? But listen to what he says. For you will laugh. It's the idea that you'll be comforted, that you will know His presence, that you know one day all of that is going to turn around. I love what Jesus says to His disciples at the Last Supper. He says, now is your time of grief, but one day you will have joy and no one will take away your joy. And the truth is, no matter how miserable today is, no matter what circumstance you're dealing with, today if you run after something else thinking that's going to bring you satisfaction, that's going to bring you happiness, that's going to be, bring you joy, when you catch it, it's empty. But if you'll stop running and you'll say, God, I want your kingdom first. He's the one who's satisfied. He's the one who, who lets you know his presence in the middle of hard things. I love in the story of Scrooge, Scrooge is talking to his nephew and he says, what do you have to be happy about? You don't have any material blessings. And he looks at his uncle and he says, uncle, what do you have to be sad about? You have all the money in the world. The truth is, it's not about what you have and it's not about the circumstance. Listen, I don't want you to have to raise your hand, but the truth is everybody's going through something or just has been through something, right? Right? And so the truth is we go through, and if we're not careful, what do we do? We focus on our circumstances. I'm hungry. I'm sad. I'm lonely. I'm tired. I'm blessed. Blessed. Blessed are those who are hungry. Blessed are those who are tired. Blessed are those who are poor. Number two, not only does happiness come from eternal focus, give and you will receive. Corey Ten Boone used to say, be careful what you hold on to tightly because God will have to pry it out of your hand. And the truth is, in our selfish and self-centered world, we sometimes think more stuff, the right thing, if I just get this next thing, if I just have the right car, if I just have the right situation, or if I get to the point that I don't have to worry so much about money, then it'll be okay. And yet, in the middle of that, Jesus says, do you want to truly be happy? Give. I'll never forget years ago, one of my mentors said to me, I always tithe. And I remember he went through a horrible downturn. He was investing in properties and lost everything. I took him to lunch one day. He used to always pay for my lunch. I took him to lunch one day. I said, I'm buying your lunch. And he didn't say no. And during that lunch, he looked at me and he, he said, you know, I'm still giving anything that God gives. I feel like if I'm faithful. Now, I will tell you that before he died, one of the things that happened is God multiplied his blessings and this verse came true. I'm not sure if it always comes true before you die, but if it doesn't come true before you die, I can guarantee that God is putting money ahead in heaven. Listen to what Jesus says next. But to those who are listening, now, first of all, he talks about giving to your enemies. Listen. But to those who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. What is he doing? He's going out of his way to bless those who don't deserve it. You ever bless somebody who didn't deserve it? You ready? This is a hard one. You ever let that person in the merge? who waited too long to get over. Now that sounds like a big deal, but the truth is sometimes it's the littlest things that make us the most angry. Sometimes it's the littlest things that we have to work on blessing other people. Sometimes it's not the big things, the big test, the big, and there are some of those, don't get me wrong. There's, there's people who hurt you. Listen to what it says next. This is the idea of giving grace, the golden rule. Do to others, as, like I talked to the kids, as you would have them do to you. 
By the way, I want to thank all of you who signed up. Tons of people signed up. Did we have a lot of people who signed up for the greeters last week? Had a lot of people signed up for the children's ministry? We still need some more sound people. But thank you, all of you who signed up. I, I, was, blown, I was blown away. And, and I know in the next few weeks, some of you are going to get calls. And thank you for those of you who didn't say, I've done this. I've done my time. I'm glad Jesus wasn't on the cross and was like, well, this is enough. And too often we go through life saying, well, I've done my part. Uh, really? No, you haven't. If I hear that from you, by the way, I will say something. I'm not nice. My staff is nice. I'm like, don't be nice. Let me yell at them. I've had too much coffee today, by the way. And I played drums this morning, which messes me up. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. By the way, this verse is thrown around incorrectly all the time. And typically it's by people who don't want you to tell them that what they're doing is wrong. If you go to somebody who is constantly driving drunk and you say, hey man, I'm worried about you, they will look at you most of the time and say, don't judge me, man. So don't mix up caring for somebody else and going out of your way to be honest with them with judgment. There is always that balance of truth and love that we have to find. So be careful that you think what this verse means is don't tell anybody what they're doing is wrong. Our society has made that true, by the way. They say, you can't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. So where do they draw the line? Wherever they think they want to. And by the way, politicians want to draw the line for you too. As Christians, we need to go back to the Bible and say, what does God say about what's right and wrong? But he goes on from there. Listen to what he says. He says, don't judge and you won't be judged. Do not condemn, you won't be condemned. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. How do you like that one? He says that one a few times. I don't like that one. By the way, don't mix up forgiveness and saying what somebody did is okay. Don't mix up forgiveness and allowing yourself to let somebody continue to hurt you. You can forgive somebody and not hang around them. You can take your car into a shop, have them rip you off, decide to forgive them, and you don't have to take your car back to that shop. Don't mix up forgiveness and discernment. Forgiveness is not necessarily forgetting either. Some of you need to remember so that you don't make the same mistake again. Forgive and you will be forgiven. You can forgive and not allow somebody to overstep their boundaries in your life. Give and it will be given to you. And I love this. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. When you give, God will bless you. So I've had people, listen, I remember a guy, they, we passed the offering plate at our church, and this guy gave, he was a traveling guy, and he said, you know, one day I put my Timex watch in the offering plate, and when I got to the back, I had a Rolex there. That's how God blesses you. And I remember thinking, this guy's an idiot. And I was a kid. Because the truth is, sometimes you give, and I promise you, if you give $20 today, which I have no idea who gives what, I never will, but here's the deal. If you give $20 today, I promise when you walk out, you'll have $20 less. <laughs> and I know that God will bless you. Well, Eric, does that mean that when I get home, I'm going to have $20 in the mailbox? Maybe. But maybe... I've had it happen. There's a couple of times that I literally wrote a check or sent money to somebody to help them and then got a check in the mail for the exact amount I had written. So I know that God sometimes like, just to show you. But I know if it's not on this earth that he will bless you. So know that if the blessing hasn't come, it will come. And here's the deal about God. He takes care of us. So when's the last time you went out of your way to bless? By the way, this is not just money. It's doing things. It's helping. This is one of the reasons people need to be in a small group. Why? Because when you're in a small group with people, guess what? When you're listening, you hear needs. And you can go out of your way to bless somebody. That's, that's not happening as you're looking at the back of somebody's head today. Hopefully, the hair's doing okay. You're like, oh, you need, I know something you need. Luke 6, why do you look... By the way, everybody struggles with this one. 
Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention, I love this, to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? And then Jesus says a word that was never used in this context. He says, you hypocrite, which was from the Greek for actor. It meant to put on a mask. He says, you actor, first take the plank from your eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And I'll be honest with you, when I notice the sin of somebody else, when I notice the struggle of somebody else, I at least struggle with that. I at least notice it. And just like the kid who says, I don't want to live with a slob to his mother, like I talked about for the kid's sermon, it's very easy to see what other people do in their lives, and it's very difficult to look at our own. One of the things I'll say in new members class this afternoon is, as Christians, we should have mirrors more than microscopes. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't, can't say to somebody, hey, listen, Driving drunk is not good. You're going to die. How about if I help you with that? Get you in an AA group. I'll go with you. That's not judging. But we always have to make sure we look in the mirror first and say, God, show me any sin in me. And by the way, the things you notice in the world that upset you, so often if you pay attention, you're doing similar things. What makes us angry is what we care about. So be careful what you get angry about. And ask God, God, would you pull the plank out of my eye? I need help with it. Number three, good fruit is from a healthy heart. I got two orange trees at home. I told you about the one that doesn't have the fruit I thought it would. But I got another one that I actually planted before that one. And last night as I was preparing, or yesterday as I was preparing for the sermon, I finally decided I'm digging up the second tree. And let me tell you why. Because I planted the second tree way before this tree. The, the, this, excuse me, I planted the first tree before the second tree. The second tree is huge. Can't get my arms around the second tree. First tree that I planted is this big. This, been this big. I've fertilized it. I've watered. I've talked nice to it. I've talked mean to it. I've yelled at it. I've encouraged it. I've blessed it. I've blessed it out. I've done all kinds of things with that tree. And you know what I realized today? It's in a bad spot. As I was preparing the sermon yesterday, I'm reading this and I'm like, you know, maybe it just needs a whole different spot. And here's the truth for you and for me. You struggling with anger? You struggling with frustration? You struggling with feeling neglected? You struggling with feeling lonely? You struggling with feeling a certain way? You struggling with your circumstances? Listen to what Jesus says. A good tree does not produce bad fruit, nor does a bad tree produce good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. People don't gather figs from thorn bushes. They don't get grapes from bushes. People bring good things out of the good they stored in their heart. How do we get what's in our heart? What you read, what you watch, who you hang around. Kristen and I were watching a series on Netflix, and, and the first one was super clean. I said, oh, finally a clean show by story three. All of a sudden, profanity laden every 12th word. And I said, Kristen, I can't watch this anymore. And it wasn't a big deal. But I said, because I've noticed when I'm driving, I'm hearing these words in my head. And it won't be long till I'll hear these words coming out of the pastor's mouth on a Sunday morning. And even if I wasn't the pastor, can I tell you something? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Listen to what it says. Good people bring good things. It says, evil people bring evil things. Out of the evil stored in their heart, people speak the things that are in their heart. So watch what you put in. Watch what you allow to be in there. Watch how you think. Somebody was telling me this morning, they had a, a, a really rough dream and then woke up angry. What happened? Whatever you were dealing with, you dream, and then you woke up and what'd you do? If you're not careful, you just pour that out on everybody else. So what do you got to do? Refill your heart. That's the reason it's great to spend time just thanking God for your blessings. Take time to spend time in God's word. Help him to, let him help you to refocus. Can I tell you the pastor doesn't always get that right? Henry Nowen says this, once we deeply trust that we ourselves 
are precious in God's eyes, we're able to recognize the preciousness of others and the unique place in God's heart. When you recognize how much God loves you, it helps you to love other people. And sometimes people who aren't as lovable. Don't you know somebody who's grumpy or angry or frustrated or isn't quite good at right? Lord, thank you that you love me. Lord, you know every thought I've had. By the way, when you see somebody else and you think, ha, huh, that person's such a jerk. Really? You ever thought about your own thoughts? What if you had thought bubbles? You'd be a jerk too. When you, some of you are like, mm, glad you didn't see that. Bacon. Number four, the foundation matters the most. One of the things I noticed this week, mom was coming down the ramp behind this building because all these trucks are clearing property over here. It actually created a crack in the, in the back porch thing and that has sunk just a little bit. What happened? The foundation was not what it was supposed to be and once the shaking happened, it came true. Can I tell you something about me and you? You ever struggle with anger? You can't blame somebody else for that. You have to say, wow. Lord, you know the foundation. Circumstances will happen, and the circumstances just prove what's really going on in your heart. Listen to this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep. He laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, and by the way, the flood always comes. When the flood came, the torrent struck the house but could not shake it. Why? Because it was well built. But the one who hears my word and doesn't put them into practice is like the man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. The moment the torrent struck the house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Too often we don't find out really what's in our hearts, what's really going on, until like the toothpaste tube, we're squeezed. And when the squeezing happens, we start to discover, ooh, I haven't really been trusting God with that area of my life. By the way, I do better with tests than I do quizzes. When the big things happen, I tend to go, oh God, I trust you. When the little things happen, I go, ah, I become Yosemite Sam all of a sudden. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I don't know. It's time to quit running after everything. It's time to evaluate our foundation. Do we care about the things that Jesus cares about or are we running after everything else to thinking that's going to make us happy? What do you think is going to make you happy? What do you think is going to bless your life? This is the first sermon of Jesus. Can you not look at your circumstances and instead say, God, thank you for the blessings the blessing of eternity. When your health starts to fail and things don't go the way you want to and that deal falls through and you don't feel like you can communicate with people and you get frustrated about certain things, are you focused on that? Or are you saying, God, thank you that you love me anyway? On my worst day, with my worst emotions, with my worst situation. And just surrender it to him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first step to being built on the foundation is to surrender your life to Him. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service of what it means to surrender to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and the truth is, for you and for me, it's easy to get focused on the circumstances of our life and miss the blessings of what God is doing. So sometimes we just need to say, God, I'm sorry I've missed the blessings. Help me to recognize the blessings you've given me in my life and quit focusing on all the hunger all the poorness, all the situations we deal with. I'm praying that you'll know his joy. We're going to pray and then we're going to have our time of giving. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you for this time this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the grace for each of us. Lord, we're all broken people who need your presence, especially when it comes to living life knowing your joy knowing that happiness that only comes from you. Lord, I pray we really could do that in our daily lives. And Father, for those times we fail, for those times that we don't forgive right or we don't see things right, Lord, would you remove the specks and the logs and the two-by-fours from our eyes so that we could see the truth, not only that you love others, but Lord, you love us deeply. 
Lord, help us to embrace that truth today. In Jesus' name, amen.